really, really delighted to welcome Muna Abu Salaman to give the very first of these um, distinguished lectures uh, from the MENA region. She is absolutely the right person to do this for us. She's an international development expert, a trailblazer in media, and a prominent figure in the landscape of positive change. Uh, and I can think of nobody better to give this inaugural lecture. I'm really delighted to welcome staff, students, alumni, members of council, president of the university here this evening. Uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Professor Jane Falkingham, and I have the honour of being the Vice President International and Engagement at the University of Southampton. So let me just say a few words about uh, Muna. Muna has been continually named as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world for her work in media, gender, leadership and education, and as an iconic Arab media personality and humanitarian. Muna has also a significant global profile and was the founding general secretary of Alweed's Philanthropies. We strive for a world of equal opportunities, which is a th philanthropic arm of His Royal Highness P Prince Alweed bin Tal Al Saud's wider holdings. During this event this evening, Muna will share her unique perspectives on the remarkable strides the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has taken in recent years. And she will also delve into the pivotal role of a robust media landscape. So before I invite her to the stage, I did want to take a moment to acknowledge the events of the past few days within the MENA region, particularly because we have so many uh, representatives from the region here and the deep impact it will have on many of our own students and staff and the community and the important role we as a university and indeed the event here this evening itself can play in providing a space where complex and at times very difficult issues can be discussed and understood. In a world of ever more partisan headlines, the freedom of expression is a principle that we as a university cherish and value and I hope we can all respect that this evening. So this evening will include a talk followed by a brief in conversation with myself and then a Q&A session with the audience. And I believe that now the, the numbers are going up as we speak. I believe there's nearly 200 people online watching us. And if you're online, please do ask your questions uh, on Slido. You have the QR code there and I will make sure that you get an opportunity uh, to ask those questions and for Muna to respond. And of course, for those of you in the room, you know what to do, <laughs> put your hand up. Um, but now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Muna to the stage. And I believe we're going to see a very short video before we hear from you. So thank you. This is actually a friend of mine who did my video, and this is the first time ever that we're showing it. So I just want to thank her since she's also joining us online. And before we start today's um, talk, I also want to offer my deep uh, condolences, prayers, heartfelt uh, support to all the people who are losing their lives in our region. Uh, it is with great sadness that we are going through this cycle again. I know that some people who are watching us have family members from both sides, and I hope that they know that we all support uh, not having any violence towards any innocent lives. So good evening. 
thank you so much for inviting me. I am so happy to be here and honored uh, with such a distinguished group of students from the region, academics, as well as community members who are interested in learning more about Saudi Arabia. Um, the progress that has happened over the past few years has been remarkable, exciting, almost unprecedented in speed transformation. Um, under the current government and the leadership of King Salman and his son, our Royal Highness, uh, the His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the country has taken a more open, focused, and thoughtful approach to its positioning locally, regionally, and globally to ensure a prosperous future for its citizens through something called Vision 2030. And this is a remarkable in many ways because it's the first time that Saudi Arabia has declared to the world that it is putting its citizens' prosperity first, as well as uh, catching up with, mo with, mo with the modern world. Uh, vision 2030 is a very detailed uh, vision of where we want to be on all fronts by 2030 and how to get there um, in every sector, uh, through every government entity, as well as just about three weeks ago, uh, the prince has announced his vision 2040 as well. So the country has worked on creating new sectors, new opportunities, not only for Saudis, including women, but also for the region. I'm going to be discussing some of the economic changes and their significance in a short while. Um, though, let me warn you, I am not an expert, neither in econ uh, economics or in politics. I want to focus first on a subject that many here are interested in, which is female empowerment. And I've worked on this issue through my media um, and through the philanthropy, uh, but I was also a first-hand witness to these changes and a participant in the journey in my own country, Saudi Arabia. As a female citizen who lived there from the 1990s to the current key period we're in today. A couple of weeks ago, I posted a video that I narrated uh, in Arabic for Vogue Arabia on Jeddah. Jeddah is a cosmopolitan coastal city. It's an ancient trading port, uh, very much like uh, around here. Uh, the commercial gateway and entry point to Mecca, the Islam's holiest city. The video is basically a love letter to Jeddah, a place that I lived on. Uh, I lived in for only one year. It is done entirely by Saudi talent, showcasing Saudi models and walking, walking around some of the famous roundabout art and ex eccentric sculptures that Jeddah is well known for. I just wanna see a very short 20 to 30 second look into it. Um, what is being said is not important. This is exactly what I just said about it, but in, in Arabic. Jeddah, did you want to جدا لما نتمشى في شوارع وكأننا بنكتشف متحف مفتوح كل دوار فيه تحفة خيالية جديدة تنبض بالحياة مين خلى الجمال أطول من ناطحات السحاب مين خلى الكرة الأرضية في وسط المدينة أعجوبة ورا الثانية تستحوذ على قلب السعودية دراجة عملاقة فقط لذلك والفوانيس المزينة بكل الألوان تنور السماء سيارات اتجمدت في وضعها للأبد الأمواج اللي بتتلألأ زي الألماس تحت أشعة الشمس لا تطرف بعينك ولا حيفوتك السحر ما في مكان زي جدة للإبداع. So I got a lot of feedback, positive feedback from people from all over the world about this video, but one in particular uh, struck me. He said, an Arab follower said, "Am I sure that women can walk around uh, without a scarf?" And I said, I am. And then he asked again, he said, so if I bring my European wife to Saudi, she doesn't have to wear hijab. And I said, I'm 100% sure of this. What struck me is the following, that this is an Arab person who should know a little bit better. So even five years after all these changes happened and that we went through in Saudi Arabia, uh, the codification of freedom uh, that women now have, people are still unaware of it, but also, that Jeddah in particular was always different and was treated differently due to the mix of its population. Uh, from ancient times, it's a trading route, uh, residents there mixed with traders, pilgrims, tribes from all over the world who came to Hajj and simply stayed there. So it is extremely cosmopolitan. 
And Jeddah was always a place where a woman could choose not to wear a scarf if she didn't want to, as some of my own cousins uh, who came, uh, who live there, don't, and still uh, don't wear it. So the millions of people who come to Jeddah each year to visit Mecca and went through the city should have experienced this. Despite this, many Arabs and Muslims still had this single narrative about Saudi women, a bit of misconception of how strict Saudi was even by Arabs. And it's difficult to shake these kind of misconceptions. Saudi is a huge country, twice the size of Egypt, three times the size of Turkey. Saudi is a very old country, only 300 years old in Al Saud rule. Yet everyone, perhaps understandably, had defined us through the narrative lens of post-1979 when the conservative Wahhabis took over the Haram uh, or the Holy Mosque. The narrative also fits a little bit with the colonial worldview of the, of the developing world. A more nuanced narrative is quite challenging to create for anybody, but it also perhaps was not wanted by either the West or some people who were in power within uh, Saudi Arabia. The diversity of Saudi culture with flower men of Asir, the Hijazi international mix of Jeddah, the cultured northern tribes who moved between Syria and Iraq did not fit the narrative and were discarded for so long, both by how the world viewed us and how very uh, strict Salafis within the country wanted us to view ourselves. Now, today, we are opening up the lines of communication to tell our story. Saudi Arabia is showcasing its diversity to the world so that people can understand this better. We are, I'm so sorry, I thought I'm gonna have a lecture so that I could uh, look back and forth. And so uh, it, this is a bit unexpected. So I'm, I'm reading a lot more than I expected. Um, and we are a little bit unapologetic about placing Saudi first in the decisions being made uh, because for so long we were expected to place Saudis last as the world demanded. Today, there are major campaigns and investments in encouraging tourism of the various regions of Saudi Arabia like Al-Ula. This is a city near Medina, which is the third holiest site in the Islamic world. Al-Ula, this small town, is filled with lore of jinn and spirits and mythical creatures roaming that ancient land. It has also one of the most magical rock formations that I have ever seen, as if the mountains themselves were players in a god's puppet show. The GCC's regions Tourism recovery has been nothing short of remarkable, both in numbers and amounts spent. It outperformed the top 10 highest spending destinations by 40%, according to MasterCard, which tracks spending across all regions. This is mostly due to Saudi Arabia opening up its cities and deserts for the first time. The entertainment industry, which perhaps is the one area where we really, truly were lacking in Saudi Arabia, as it was where the conservative religious restrictions took hold has exploded. We have film festivals and we have music festivals. There are 30 million residents, most of whom are youth, 19 million of them are Saudi. Male and females with significant disposable income participating and enabling these sectors to grow exponentially. So much so, that we now have the world, the Middle East most prominent music concert, something called Middle Beast. More than 600,000 people attended this three-day concert. But we have also invested in the future. Neom is a city that will bring the future to the present in sustainable technology to solve today's needs. There's a huge push in general for green tech and greening of the Middle East. There are large investments being made to bolster up those sectors and some of the most innovative technologies and scientists are now starting to come to Saudi to work or help in creating a better future for the world. The research and development that is taking place right now is going to be transformational, not just for Saudi, but inshallah for the world. And we're just at the very beginning of this. From an economic point of view, Saudi is the fastest growing G20 nation and has made a case for itself as an emerging leader in the 21st century. And we are determined to be the century's success story. But if we go back to the women of Saudi Arabia. In the past, women in Saudi Arabia faced many restrictions, 
For a period, they were not allowed to drive, travel without a male guardian, or hold certain jobs. This is true. Women of means, like me, were able to circumvent this, but many were not. Though there is one crucial exception to note in this, that women have excelled in uh, tertiary education and even exceeded the number of men graduating from college, even in the heart sciences for the past 20 years. This is probably one of the main reasons that we had so many qualified women ready to immediately step in the newly opened positions and opportunities that Saudi Arabia offered them when it changed. This, ha this has allowed for the rapid acceleration of female integration into the workforce. And now today we stand at 37% in 2023, which was in 2018, only 19%. However, today, Women in Saudi Arabia are driving, traveling, studying abroad, like so many we have, making their own choices, holding the jobs that they want, and positions in all sectors of the economy. They're also starting their own businesses and becoming official leaders in their communities versus the unofficial leadership and advisory role they had held for so long. And they're getting amazing support from the government to help them reach an equitable future a huge push to resolve challenges that women faced in the workforce, like affordable childcare, enrollment in free leadership training, ensuring the inclusion of women's names for all positions open. This progress has not come easy. Progress actually doesn't come easy in any country. It's a struggle everywhere. The World Economic Forum says that to get true gender parity, it will take us, it will take us another 100 years. Um, and we're proud in Saudi Arabia of where we are. It has taken many people's hard work and dedication to go from ideas to actual on the ground implementation. And we are not done yet. There's still work to challenge traditional stereotypes as there is almost everywhere in the world. There's a redefinition of what it means to be female, a leader, a good citizen, and each country and region will have different answers that fit them and where they belong and where they want to go. The Saudi government realizes and knows that women are a key to Saudi Arabia's future. Without us, without our full participation, prosperity cannot be achieved. And one of the most important things that we have to really remember is that this is part of the journey. We are still not where we want to be. This is not 2030. We have another seven years to go. But we have already, as I stated, achieved one of our goals, which is a better participation of females in the labor force, knowing that that will lead to more independence, the ability to make your own choices without the influence of others who might control you through financial means. These are all little things that maybe some people take for granted, but are huge achievement that have been done only in five years. Thank you so much for listening to my talk, and I appreciate being invited. So um, you've touched upon um, the issue of female empowerment, and I wondered if I could just ask you to reflect a little bit of, on your own career. You've had an impressive uh, career as a businesswoman, an activist, and a spokesman, spokesperson. Sorry, gosh, it's a Freudian slip, isn't it? Spokes person. Could you give us a, a brief snapshot of your own journey and how it's felt to navigate such a unique path? So I started actually as a professor, uh, well not professor, we call it Muhadra, lecturer in uh, English, an English literature lecture at the University of King Saud. Um, and I taught there for eight years. I had uh, arrived from, so let me just go a little bit further. Um, I was born in the U.S. I lived between uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, uh, Malaysia, and the U.S. And so I led a very international life from a very young age. Um, I got married. I came back to Saudi Arabia. And there weren't that many uh, professions open. You had to be a doctor, uh, somebody who worked in a bank, or basically um, a teacher, whether in school or in college. And so I joined uh, the teaching profession, which I loved. Uh, doesn't pay very well, but I loved it. And um, But I always knew that I could do other things. And two things helped me. I was not restricted by 
by what my family thought because my family was very progressive. I did not need an income. And so if there was any kind of threat to my income, it would not have mattered so much. And so um, when I was around 28 years old, an opportunity came to um, join a pan-Arab TV show called Kalam Nawan. Uh, we translated to Softly Speaking. I became the number one Arab show um, for social issues. Actually, only a singing show was did better than us. We made the we made the channel a lot of money, um, and through that, I became very well known. I also started learning about the similarities and differences between the family and female issues across the region. There are certain patterns, but there are certain countries that, like Tunisia, for example, that were able to break through those patterns and the reasons for that. And so it was an amazing education uh, for me. After that, I joined the Al Walid bin Talal Foundation, where I, well, actually, no, I, I joined his company and then I created the foundation. And one of the top things that we did was we created some centers for the Islam West um, conversations in different ways. Uh, so I think in Edinburgh, we had something to do with education. At Cambridge, we did something with um, uh, policy. Uh, at Harvard, it was for um, government uh, uh, policies. So different things. Anyways, uh, worked through that. In 2011, I decided I wanted to strike on my own. But one thing that empowered me was that my parents always taught us that they did not have a say in our decisions. We could make our own decisions. And there's a lot of women like me, but usually we had certain criteria. Um, so the women that their families did control, or there was some kind of reputational risk to their tribe, they were not able to take the risks that I did. Um, they were not allowed to sometimes. Um, and so I was very, very lucky in, in the family that I was born. Uh, the issue is that that should not matter. It should be, and this is what's happening right now, is it does not matter. Women from the age of 21 have full control over their destiny. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing your personal journeys. You, you've spoken a little bit about the misconceptions of Islam in, in the West and also about Saudi in the West. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and um and the change points so part of it is of course I'm, I'm speaking here to a very educated um group people who are interested in knowledge and truth and research which is not always the same so if we leave that group and we look at mainstream media we look at mainstream um knowledge the the way that Islam is being presented is as a terrorist, backward people. I mean, the minute you wear a scarf, people immediately think of you as less disciplined, less uh, intelligent, and your cultural values become a disadvantage. Rather than saying there's different ways of doing things and uh, different priorities for people, and uh, People in the East, for example, value certain things more than they value others, and therefore we just get along. It is taken as a sign of weakness and a sign of lack of development. Um, Saudi, for a very long time, was very insular and did not explain itself. It felt actually insulted by a lot of the things that were happening, and that allowed other people's narratives to take over. Um, and I think one of the changes that now we're taking control of our own narrative and we're opening up the country saying, come see us and figure out what, who we are by your own eyes. I think that's one of the major differences that has happened. Thank you. And um, you've advocated for mothers in the workplace and argued that their unique skills enrich the world of work. Can you just expand a little bit upon this as well? So I did a, that talk uh, called Monetization of Motherhood. Um, and I was looking at some of the um, facts that were being given, that a lot of uh, women are not able to have kids because they pass certain age and after because they're working, studying, you know, trying to make a living, and then their fertility goes down. So that's nature, right? And by the time they have their first child, uh, that's when the pay gap really starts, actually. 
And the second child is when they actually leave work, according to uh, the International Labor um, Organization. And so when I'm looking at all of these things, I'm thinking, well, the world, which runs on money, right? Money makes the world go round, needs consumers. And consumers have to be born. <laughs> and therefore, it is in the best benefit that we actually, of the world that we have enough children and if we want to have enough children, we have to accommodate what mothers do, and we have to accommodate their needs when they need it. And so, for example, I thought that um, there has to be different ways of... Uh, so, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, it used to be that you can only get your scholarship after a certain number of um, uh, years, up, so up to five or six years after you graduate. That's when they give you a free scholarship to do your master's. Now it's open until you're 40. So that allows you to be able to have your children and then decide to study and still get the same opportunity as somebody else. So this is something that would accommodate um, uh, the childbearing years. I thought that we should uh, look at moms and look at the skills that they are contributing to their families and actually count them in your resume. So that if you are a mother uh, you know, and, and you took three years off, uh, the organizing, scheduling, taking care, making sure that everybody is, you know, uh, uh, well, this should count for something. These are skills. The caregiving skills are skills um, that can be translated. I thought that there should be some kind of courses that are given to women that are free from the government. Uh, so every year you would have three months worth of courses that would help update you in whatever sector you are. In. So you would be meeting with mentors, you take some classes, you do different things, just so that you're still within your sector's um, progress, so that you don't have an imposter syndrome when you go back to work and feel whatever job they give you, you should be so thankful for, that you, it, it would give you a better footing when you come in. And these kind of adjustments need to be cultural, but also systemic and structured within companies, within academic areas, etc., um, that allows us to fulfill both things, uh, reach our potential as human beings and reach our potential as mothers if we choose to. Uh, and they should not be contradictory and they should not be uh, a disadvantage. Thank you. I love that idea that actually organizing the, the schedules of the children is a transferable skill. Absolutely. I could see the women around the room nodding to it. And I think, Vice Chancellor, we should add, definitely add that to our, our, our university CV as we go forward. Thank you so much. A final question for me before I open up for a question and answer from the floor is, what are your hopes for the next generation of women in Saudi? So... This is the, my daughter is with me, by the way, today here. And I remember when we were discussing driving. And so I have my driver license. I only drove once. I don't like driving personally. And I think people in Britain who use the public uh, services understand this. Driving is not a, an amazing thing, but you should have that choice. You should be able to make that choice for you. And so that's what we fought for. And that's what we wanted. And that's what we were discussing for many years to be able to have the choice to make, to be able to have the opportunity to make the choices that fit you. Um, so right now, women in Saudi Arabia have that. The minute they each 20, the minute they reach 21, they're able to decide where they want to live. They want to live alone. They want to live with their family. If they want to uh, work, if they want to um, travel, they want to leave, they want to study. There's no restrictions on them. So everything is available to them. But I do hope that's like, I, I don't think it's only for the women of Saudi Arabia. I think it is for women all over the world that our value, our caregiving, our way of Doing things should be acknowledged as equal to those of men. Uh, that's what I wish for. And I think that would significantly reduce the 100 years of gender parity that we're waiting for. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm now going to open up to the floor for any questions. Professor Beige. Uh, thank, welcome to Southampton and thank you for the talk. From business school. I have a question about what motivates you to do all of this. You know, I've been following your work and there are many things that you are 
doing that could simply say, I'll pass. What motivates you? I just, I'm interested in hearing that. So thank you so much. So there's two things that motivate me. First of all, I love the universalization of opportunity for everybody. Everybody should be able to access equal opportunities, your age, your gender, your you know, orientation, your whatever you have should not stop you from reaching your potential. And so this is something that is really very deeply ingrained uh, in, in me. The second thing is actually, I pass on a lot of stuff. Whenever I see a problem, I look, is anybody else doing something about it? Are they doing it good enough? And if they are, let them do it. Bless their hearts. I'll just sit that one out. So I only really act when I think something is really important. And for some reason, nobody is acting up, you know, like somebody should, nobody is doing it. Then you need to get up and do it. So that's, that's my motto in life, but thank you. Thank you very much. It's quite groundbreaking in your area. But I am interested uh, to know, because you, based on what you say, you are coming from a very privileged background, how much these changes internalize within the society. Like so I'm not aware, aware of the condition of Saudi Arabia, but I'm coming originally from Iran, and I'm aware of the condition with, in the countries with Muslim living countries condition of the woman, how much you are optimist because you are coming from a very privileged background that it is internalized within all level of the society and all yes. class of people. So this is a very important question, right? Because I, I admit it to my privilege in the very beginning. My father was uh, president of a university, very well um, known all over the world. We've lived all over the world. So I think I was just a little bit ahead of my times. So I got where I am because of my family. I think the so for example, I remember my daughter, my youngest daughter, not Shahad, um, when she had to, when she was 21 years old, she had to do her passport. And this was three years ago. And she wanted her father to go and get her passport because usually that's what fathers do. They go and they do everything for you up till, you know, five years ago. And I said, no, no, you're 21 now. Uh Things have changed in Saudi Arabia. You actually have to go and get your passport. Your father can't get it for you anymore. It's your passport. And she's like, oh, I like the old way more. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think the government is very insistent, very committed that women feel on in every step of the way of their journey as they're growing up. Um, so uh, another example would be, uh, it used to be when you went to college, your uh, wali al-amr, whoever is your guardian, would have to sign that he allows you to go to college. By the way, both for males and females, not just uh, females. But females had more stuff. Uh, now, there is no such thing. You go and you actually apply on your own and you decide what major you want to do. Um, your parents don't even know what you've um, uh, decided or which universities you've applied to. So there is a very consistent change in almost every moment of a woman's journey to feel that she is really in control of her own choices. Now, the problem is when parents don't like the choices that they're seeing and they can't do anything about it. So yes, society will take some time, but I think parents share that frustration all over the world. Thank you very much for that talk. I was, was going to, you earlier on said about Saudi Arabia's GDP, and I know it's uh, it's bigger than India, and India and Saudi Arabia are the only two that have got really big GDP going on in the G20 right now. Could you elaborate on that? How do you think uh, the shift is taking place from oil to non-oil uh, economy? So again, I'm not really an expert on this, um, and there's a lot of things happening. But for example, we have a lot of investments in technologies and bringing in um, companies to Saudi Arabia uh, in supporting the small and medium businesses uh, in renewables. So there's so much happening within uh, the government, and there is 
what is very nice is that there is, um, I think, a weekly meeting between the ministers so that they're all on the same page. And if one person is facing an issue with whatever sector he's working on uh, due to another ministry, then they immediately do it. So that the rate of response to problems has become extremely uh, fast. Um, are we where we want to be? I know that they have said that we're not. We want more direct investments. We want more renewables. We want more um, different sectors to open up. But I think the tourism, the entertainment industries have done an amazing uh, amount of work uh, so far beyond what was expected. Thank you very much. Most inspiring. Um, I have a rather ambitious wife myself. Uh, who's made quite a big difference in the world of diplomacy in, in the UK. Uh, but I wanted to ask you something completely different, really, which is that when I mean, you're talking about um, you know, social and economic issues, really, and the role of women, um, uh, people from the outside looking in uh, at the Middle Eastern world tend to get stuck on, uh, are they Shia, are they Sunni? Um, is that something that arises in the kind of work you're doing? I mean, your colleague at the back is from Iran. She's from a Shia background. You would be from the Sunni background. You'd assume. Does, does, it, yeah. does it matter much? So, I mean, I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia right now. I'm talking about the Sunni uh, Shia division. Uh, it does matter. Uh, there are issues, and I don't think it's a religious issue. I think it's a political issue that uses religion. Uh, so this is very important. So does it matter? We're seeing it in Lebanon. We're seeing it in Yemen. We're seeing a lot of destruction happening due to those um, uh, uh, people using uh, uh, religion as a way of uh, destroying each other. So it matters extremely. But the Sunni world is 90% and Shia is 10%. So there is an imbalance between the numbers. Um, in Saudi Arabia, we used to have in the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken, some issue with Shias. Uh, uh, what has happened is in the 1980s, late 1980s, late 19, uh, into the 1990s, there was a lot of dialogue. We had the um, uh, country dialogue where they would bring leaders together to talk and to discuss how uh, the minority can feel more comfortable. So now we have uh, Shias as the, the head of Neom is Shia, the head of um, Aramco, the two most important basic uh, things in uh, creating our GDP is our uh, Shia. And so I think we are kind of behind that. Uh, but in the end, whether you are Sunni or Shia, your alle allegiance should be to your country. Uh, so your religion shouldn't matter. And I think that's a very important point to make. And by the way, um, I think in Iran, like I, I have never visited Iran, so I don't know Iran. I'm very happy that our relationship with the country is improving. Uh, but I've also heard that Iranians are extremely modern, very European, and that the, what we see on TV is quite different from the reality of, of the majority of the culture. Hmm? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but even within Iran itself, that also we have a stereotype of what Iran looks like or the Iranians look like uh, or what Shias are doing um, that is being uh, perpetuated by uh, by the media. So uh, I hope that, uh, inshallah, Iran will catch up with us. So this is advanced warning for our colleagues with the microphones that the question after next, I'm going to move to online. So we have one more question in the room, and Claire, can you? And then can, and then we'll come back in the room again. Don't don't worry. But I think we do have to to give our colleagues online an opportunity. But please. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I missed the beginning of your talk, but um, I'm interested in your take on what the you, you touched on the media sort of portrayal or selective portrayal of certain parts of and the feel that. We need to liberate women out of a certain state or condition because of perceived notion of what it will be. And again, you know, how the UN Charter or, you know, and what a woman should have rights in from one perspective without taking the cultural sort of uniqueness of 
different communities around the world, including the Middle East. Do you feel that is a, you are in a position to challenge that and say a woman's perspective on what a woman should have as a right and that to the exclusion of any other perspective is wrong? Can you challenge that? So I don't think uh, I understood the full question, but let me tell you what I understood from it. So I do think universal values is actually Western values. And there has not been a discussion of Eastern values being equally important. And every time there's a discussion about this, the Western world does kind of, uh, what is it, uh, Ramrod? What is it? What is that? Yeah, yeah uh, over the Eastern um, uh, perspective, and they have the power in the United Nations, they have the power in a lot of the councils, and therefore the discussion is always not uh, equal, and the outcome is not always equal. And what happens is that when enough inequality in these kind of discussions happens, then the uh, the Eastern world, through whichever issue it is, will make a coalition and make their own universal or, uh, you know, humanitarian declaration and say, well, this is ours. And so this is what keeps on happening. Do I see that changing? I just witnessed the whole week of dehumanization of Palestinians. So I don't think that's going to be changing soon. I do think eventually the world will have to come to a way of respecting each other. And as I said, our place in each, in, in our journeys as cultures. Thank you. Thank you. So turning to online, Bashir, Professor Bashir Lawide. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks Mula, for such a, an inspiring uh, talk. So the first question here says, what reforms did KSA made or make in sponsorship in the sponsorship system for foreigners who wants to work in the kingdom? So one of the most important, I think, uh, changes, of course, anybody who comes to the well, even to the UK or any country, has to be asked to come in. Uh, there is a certain job position that is needed that we don't have in, in the country, and therefore we're bringing people in. It used to be that once you come in, you are kind of bound to the same company that you've uh, uh, that requested you, and therefore they kind of controlled your work professional journey. Now I think after one year of working with them, uh, you can switch to any other more competitive or different sector without even their permission. So this is one of the most important changes. Thank you very much. Um, the other question here says, um, what strategies or approaches, this is to yourself, uh, do you believe individuals could uh, utilize to empower themselves and cultivate a sense of personal fulfillment and well-being? That's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think one of the most interesting things that will happen with AI and not just chat GPT, but this whole idea of personalization of education. Uh, part of it will be very beneficial to young students in, in schools who are struggling so that they will have their own personal tutor, but also even us as adults doing our own continuous education will have a way of conversing with, I don't wanna say creatures, but experts the best experts in the world through AI and helping each person figure out what is best for them at each moment in their lives. So I think there's going to be a revolution in this whole self-fulfillment, whether you're going to a spiritual or professional or personal development, it's just going to be extremely different and it's going to be very accessible to everybody. There's going to be more equal footing. The knowledge will no longer be to those who can pay for it whether it's a book or an executive education at Harvard, you'll be able to get it through AI. Thank you very much. Another question here, again, is a, reflecting, a reflection on yourself. As a woman of faith, um, did you face any hidden barriers, such as family restrictions, that impacted who you are today? Um, so I'm visibly Muslim. This means I can't go to a lot of networking that happens in bars, which... No, unfortunately, a lot of after work activities involved us. So this was a barrier. 
uh, that you had to overcome. The way I did it was I would create an amazing event or things to do that everybody else wanted to go to that would fit my faith and uh, go around it. Um, and so, yeah, I think women in general, not just women of faith, have a lot more barriers uh, to overcome. Things are getting better. Things are changing, especially with as each generation comes in to this idea of equity. We are seeing that. Um, but I, the other thing is that looking the way that I look, a lot of people will dismiss me from certain positions. They will not think of me. I will not come to mind because I do not fit the image that they think of. Sort of like when they say um, uh, the doctor and you see a male instead of a female, that uh, that exercise. I don't know if you've uh, done that exercise where they tell a story of somebody and they're like, well, the son and... and you keep thinking it's the father and it's the mom who was the doctor. So same thing. If you think of somebody who is in a position of power, a CEO of a multinational, the United Nations Secretary General, you don't see somebody who looks like me. You see somebody who looks more Western. And so that's, I think, an issue that I don't think we will overcome it during my lifetime. Thank you. Let's hope we do. Okay, one more online, Bashir, yeah, and then Bashir, I'll come back okay. into the room. So I understand, you know, and I appreciate one of that you said you're not a politician, but this is just talks about, you know, with with KSA would be a democratic country in the future. So see, this is again like the framework, like democracy. We have a Shura Council. And people dismiss it because it's an Arab Shura Council, because it's an Arab parliament, right? So they don't think that it has any consultative powers. We have a, minister, a cabinet of ministers that meet every... And so that, that question immediately assumes that because there's a monarchy, which, by the way, this we also have here in this country. So it's like different when you're talking the U.S. Um, that immediately means we don't have a democratic... Even the council of uh, princes that chooses who is going to be next in line. There is democ democratic practices, but within our own culture. So I, I don't like that question. Thank you very much. Can I just ask my own questions in? Go on. Thank you very much. So we're a democracy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so when you talked about the 2030 vision, so I am well aware of the what's going on in Saudi. So I think the 2030 vision has got another six to seven years to go. Yes. And this is an agenda that started by the current Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman some time ago. Mm -hmm. And he just announced, as you said, the, 20, the 2040. So how far, in your opinion, um, uh, the agenda, if you like, uh, uh, has been achieved in relation to the 2030? And what else left you think that when, so uh, when 2030 was, was announced and we saw the things that were going to be accomplished, everybody thought, it's like, oh, it's going to take us 2050. Uh, there's no way, because we were used to the way things were done, where things took time, there was lots of committees, things happened gradually in phases, and nobody realized that there was so much research already done that this was actually the end result of so many things. And so change became extremely rapid. And I think in the very beginning, when ministers didn't deliver, they were changed. Like we'd wake up four in the morning, they're like, oh, the minister changed. Why? Because he didn't um, you know, accomplish as much as was uh, needed. And so there was in the very beginning, like this shock to the system of how rapid and quickly uh, the prince wanted things to be done. But we still thought by 2030, these things will happen. The majority of the things that he wanted to happen have already happened. This is why we have 2040, because we've surpassed in so many things, not just female um, empowerment, but also in unemployment, but also in the um, amount of money that each sector is bringing into the country. And so that is one of the reasons that people are very optimistic about Saudi future. So I think there was a study done. We're the second happiest country in the world after Bhutan. I don't think anybody would have thought this, uh, you know, just uh, 10 years ago. But the youth have a lot of ambitions and they're finding people to support them, whether financially through um, uh, grants, through uh, investments, uh, through training. And very few countries have that amount of investment into their uh, young population. And I think we're 70% young, below 35 so that's so kind of you um just uh, just um 
something that really has been uh, in my thinking. Um, the Crown Prince uh, or, or has, you know, the the Ministry of Higher Education in in Saudi has always been led by professors. Now the Crown yes. Prince, <laughs> Crown <laughs> Prince, exchange. <laughs> we got somebody from the private sector to come and lead this time. Exactly, the head of Aramco. that's why things are happening. <laughs> yeah, the head of Aramco now is the 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 Minister of Higher. Education. Why, why is this thinking? Why is this shift? He wants people who get things done. Uh, he doesn't want committees anymore. The, the, the decisions have been made. The research has been done. We don't need to second guess. There's a lot of things that have to be done. And he wanted people who have a proven record of transformation as the Minister of Health, the Minister of Hajj, the Minister of uh, Communications and the Internet and all these things, and the Minister of Education. I mean, just like bringing in people from the private, uh, the Minister of Labor as well bringing people from the private sector with a very long record of huge transformations within their huge companies. Um, Thank you very much. I had the honor of meeting um, the minister about three weeks ago in, in, in London. Extremely and, and lovely. It, it, extremely lovely and also in a hurry. I got that, I got that. Um, He's an extremely lovely shark. Yeah, absolutely. So a final question back in the room. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Thank you very much. Muna, thank you for a really interesting insight into modern Saudi Arabia and uh, very impressive, actually, the strides forward that, that the country's taken in, as you say, the last five years. Now, I'm a civil engineering uh, alumni of this university, and something that stuck in my mind, what you said, was how successful Saudi is being in getting women to study engineering and science and technology, which is fantastic. Now, this is something we're still struggling with in this country. It's really still quite hard to get women to come to universities to study engineering and some other STEM subjects. So my question is whether the UK can learn anything from Saudi on how on and how to do anything. Uh, maybe that topic, if not, but anything no, at all. Answer, anything because I have I have research on this, and so one of the reasons that we have so many women in the hard sciences um, is that because we had um, in middle school we have segregated schools, so females and males don't study together. And so one of the research that I looked into, it showed that in middle school, what happens that girls start taking a back um, back seat to men and they allow them to, um, even the teachers, I think subconsciously ask more boys to do stuff with the hard sciences and get women to go more into the literature and the plays and all these kind of um, uh, social sciences. Um, and I think the segregation allowed girls who had any kind of intellectual interest into um, math and physics to excel and feel that they are amazing at it. And so it is a very easy um, jump to go into engineering when engineering colleges opened. It was not even, it was a no brainer. So I don't think that this is a cultural thing, right? We have that and it's um, this is the way that we, we uh, have our schools. I don't think it'll be easy to do it within your context. This is again, the journey, right? Your journey, in the way that you look at female male interactions are very different and it leads to certain issues, advantages and disadvantages. And our journey is quite different and it led to some disadvantages, but it also led to some advantages. Um, so. And, and I think the international evidence would, would back you up on that. And as a, a daughter of a, a chemistry teacher, a woman chemistry teacher teaching in an all girls school, um, she would say that her her students went on to study in STEM. Because they so, didn't think they couldn't. So they didn't think they could. I'm really sorry. I mean, we could stay here all evening. I can see hands coming up all over the place. But I think we, we have to start winding it up. And I need to pass the floor to my boss, who is a man. Uh, but I'm delighted that we have the president and vice chancellor of the university here. Thank you. So first of all, can I say what a fantastic talk, uh, absolutely inspiring. And I was really impressed by the breadth that you covered. You talked about Jeddah, you talked about the development in Saudi Arabia, and you then personalized it in terms of your journey. And I think that made it a very real talk for many people who are in the room and also uh, listening online. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's much that I could reflect on, uh, and I think you, you there were many both challenges and points that you made that I think us as individuals and us as 
an institution you need to reflect on. And one of the points that was made to one of the answer to the question is something that worries me all the time, actually. I don't know what the right answer is, by the way, to what I'm about to say, but um, nevertheless, it worries me, which is that when we have debates within the university, uh, and we often look at international links, for example, we often project Western values onto those countries. And I always worry, you know what, that makes an assumption that we're right and that they're wrong. And I've never thought, I, I've never believed that has to be true. Nevertheless, uh, as you know, in, in universities, uh, many people think uh, they're uh, necessarily right all the time, which is a problem, actually. But nevertheless, I think that challenge that you um, gave to us was a really good one, amongst the other many great, uh, many great points that you made. Uh, I, I've personally witnessed um, some of the really great progress that's been made in Saudi Arabia. It's, uh, it's got lots of fantastic things going on. Some of these projects are really world class. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that as we as a university are always looking for partnerships with things that are world class. So we're, we're definitely looking at Saudi Arabia as, as a key partner. So thank you very much for that. I think we've got a small, small present just to say thank you. I have no idea what it was. I always get nervous at this point. I hand something over and I have no idea what it is. But nevertheless, I'm sure that I've done a good job. But can I say thank you very much? on behalf of the university and I'm sure all the people who are watching online and in the room for your fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for coming today. As I said at the start, this is the inaugural uh, distinguished lecture of our new MENA networker at the university. And we've set up this network to challenge ourselves and also to value ourselves as a community and I can think of no finer speaker to set us off on this journey so thank you once again thank you thank you very much everyone for coming and thank you for all of you online for being with us tonight as well thank you <laughs>